Hey friends at Mid Valley Baptist Church. I'm coming to you today from my home because earlier this morning at church, we had everything set up. Church went great. Worship team was wonderful. And at the very end of the service, I discovered that we hadn't pushed the record button for the service. So I'm not going to re-preach everything, but I'd like to give you a summary so that you kind of know where we're coming from. I'll refer a little bit to my notes here. We're, kinda, we're coming up on chapter 14 in the book of Revelation, which is an overview of the entire tribulation. We're sort of in that in-between stage, in between the six trumpet judgments and the six, or seven trumpet judgments and the seven bowl judgments. And there's sort of an interlude that gives us different areas of, of, uh, of summary. Whereas the uh, seven characters of chapters 12 and 13 kind of gave us an overview of salvation history. This chapter, chapter 14, gives us uh, kind of the, uh, the seven chroniclers or seven specific individuals that give us messages. Um, and we're not going to go with each of those messengers because they all really kind of interrelate. But as we kind of unpack how they interrelate, there's four basic messages that come out of chapter 14. And the first one is the worship in Zion. These messages that take place overarching the tribulation will take place at different points of the tribulation. In fact, this one will take place, what will the millennium look like uh, just after the tribulation and some of the things that are there. So let me start off by reading the first five verses of Revelation chapter 14. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000, who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I have heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters, like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne, and before the four living creatures, and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. And it is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless." Let's just pray as we get into God's word for a little bit here and ask him to make this clear and relevant. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for its clarity and help us to understand so we might make application to our life. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we begin to look at these first five verses, this is actually post-tribulation right into the millennium, and it talks about the worship in Zion. The worship in Zion, um, the, the sermon notes will be attached to this, and they won't be as full for this as they would have been had you been uh, had worshiped it there or had we pushed the record button. But nonetheless, it's there. And so we want to talk about the worship in Zion. First of all, number one in your notes, the, the verse one talks about a particular person, the person of Zion. That's number one in your notes. Now, some of these will have some subpoints, and we'll get to those, some of those. But first it says, Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb. Well, which Lamb? Well, we know it as the Lamb, or the Lamb of God. This Lamb was spoken of in Isaiah 53, verse 7, where it says, He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. We know that was talking about as a uh, 700 years prior is talking about Jesus coming in the future like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers so he did not open his mouth and in Jesus's case he was led to slaughter he didn't open his mouth in his defense or complaint about the way that he was treated and here we find three characteristics in scripture about this lamb number one he is a redeeming land in, uh, lamb. In John 1, 28, uh, and, verse, and verse 28 and 29, these things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. So we know the context of this. And the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so this is a redeeming land. Jesus takes our sin away from us. 
But the way that he took it away is because point B, that one of the subpoints under num number one here, that he was a ruined lamb. In other words, he was a lamb that had died and then was rose again. Jesus was crucified, dead, and buried to pay for our sins. We we're first introduced to this lamb in the book of Revelation in chapter 5, verse 6. And we're told by John, he says, And I saw between the throne with the four living elders and the, el uh, the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if it had been slain. So there is this ruined nature, this, it, 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 he had died or had been crucified. But it says, a, landing, a lamb standing as if it had been slain. So he's standing now. So not only is a redeeming lamb, he's a ruined lamb, but more importantly, he's a resurrected lamb, standing as if he had been slain. The lamb is up. The lamb was slain for our sins, but he's also raised. And the story of Jesus doesn't end at the grave. It simply continues at the, res at the resurrection. He was the resurrected lamb that's there. So number two in our notes, if you're following along, it, the next thing it talks about is the place of Zion. And John says in verse 1 of Revelation chapter 14, Then I looked and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb. So we're talking about a, an actual place. This Lamb in the millennium will stand on Mount Zion. And there's a number of things about Mount Zion that we need to notice here. One of them, it's both heavenly and earthly. There are, there are references in scripture about this heavenly Zion, but the city of Jerusalem is also count, called Zion. And, and another thing, it's both ancient and yet future. The ancient part that the city of Israel in its entire history, way back when it was used to be called Jebus, before Israel conquered the land and took it over and, and maintained it for themselves, used to be called Jebus. But in the very, from this very inception, Till today, the city of Jerusalem has been built, sacked or destroyed and rebuilt a cycle of 21 times over its entire history. And Revelation 14 speaks of a Zion of events in Jerusalem that are yet to take place in the future. It's in our future and it's the millennium that'll take place at that particular time. And yet it's not only an ancient but a future but it's also Jewish and universal. We know it, it's Jewish, it's where the temple was, it's where they called their capital city. And yet there's still a future part to Zion. Many passages of scripture sound the Jewishness of this in Jerusalem, and yet there's a universal application to God's plan in these ages. In Psalm chapter two, starting at about verse 10, scripture says, now therefore, O kings, show discernment, Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. So here we see that the psalmist is not talking to Jews particularly. He's talking about kings of the earth and judges of the earth. So this is for the nations universal. Do homage to the Son, that he, uh, that he not become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. This is a promise of for, for the provision of salvation, not just for the Jews, but all who take refuge in the Lord Jesus. And then number three in your outline are the people of Zion. Uh, it mentions those in the latter part of verse one. It says, and with him, with the lamb, were 144,000 who had his name on his father's, who had, and he, I'll start that again. 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. This is a unique group of people. We've talked about them a little bit earlier in the book of Revelation, but it says that they will accompany the lamb wherever he goes. This is their, their millennial status as they come into the revelation. We have seen them before. This is the, out of the 12 tribes, the remnant of Israel, there'll be 12,000 from each tribe. Earlier in the tribulation, they will have been brought to Christ, uh, to claiming Christ as their Messiah, as their Savior, and they will be uh, sent out as evangelists, and they will be sent out to where they are um, leading others to Christ in the world, but the 144,000 of them. 
These are the Jewish evangelists that God will raise up during the tribulation. And now the reward is in heaven. If you're taking finer notes here, uh, letter A, they're untouchable uh, in latter part because it says in, in, in one that they've got the father's name and the son's name on their foreheads. And this is a sign that they cannot be touched by Satan. He might go after others. He might go after believers that are Gentiles. He might go after non-believers at all. And it'll be massive death during the tribulation. But the 144,000 are locked away and secure and nothing can happen to them outside of God's, uh, God's care. Not only were the 144,000 untouchable, they are, and look at the latter part of verse 3, and no one could learn the song that they were singing. This was a new song that they were singing. No, no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. So that letter B, they're also unique. Letter A, they're untouchable. Letter B, they're unique. Part of the reward for the 144,000, they get to learn and sing a new song. And no others could listen and worship, but they couldn't learn the song. They didn't have the ability or they weren't given that ability to learn the tune of the words of the song. But it was still a time of great praise and worship uh, that will be experienced from the 144,000 to the Lamb in the millennial reign of Christ. They could sing, but others could worship. Now, the 144,000 are unique before God. But so are you. Each one of us is unique before God, and he has a special place for us in his kingdom. Not only were they untouchable, not only were they unique, but letter C, they're also undefiled. Now, these little subpoints A, B, and C, are not in your notes anymore. I just have the major four points outlined in your notes, but you'll, you can write in those little fine points if you want to. Verses 4 and 5 say, These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. They are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And, and no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. They're pure. They're faithful. These 144,000, they're a great example for us today. They're faithful and they're pure. They say no to sin, yes to the Lamb as he leads them along. They choose to follow wherever he goes and they are undefiled. The days of the tribulation will be vile and wicked and immoral and horrible. And I'm sure the temptation to, to cheat just a little or get some reprieve and try to find some, some self-pleasure to, to relieve themselves of the agony that will be present during the tribulation would be there. But they didn't do that. They stuck to their faithfulness to God. They were untouchable. They couldn't be killed for their faith, but they still had to go through the tribulation period of time, being God's witness for them. The 144,000 will remain themselves pure. They will be undefiled by the world around them. Now, here's a statement I want you to remember. I'll repeat it, I'll repeat it a couple of times. It only takes a moment to violate your purity, but it takes a lifetime to maintain it. So we're in it for the long haul. It only takes a moment for one to violate their purity, but it takes a lifetime to maintain it. So hang in there, stick with it, follow God, be faithful, and be true. The 144,000 are untouchable, you were unique, they were undefiled. They're a great example for us. And then number four in your outline, there is great praise in Zion. Let me see. Uh, it, it, let me start with verse two, and I'll read through the first part of verse three. It says, And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. This will be one gigantic celebration party. It's in the millennium. It's after the tribulation. And this song, it says it'll be like several things. And John kind of describes it the best way that he can. It, it talked of sound of many waters. There'll be a sense of which the sound of the unified voice of 144,000 in the choir singing this song will have a, a sense of unrestrained exuberance as they celebrate the victory of the Lamb. And it says a sound of loud thunder. It's like we win. We finally win. And, and there's a victory celebration that's going on. And it's like the sound of many harpists. And a lot of times in Scripture, it, harps are used, 
Harps and lyres are similar instruments, but harps or lyres were used to celebrate and used to have joy and used to celebrate peace or actually bring tranquility. And so here in this passage, the sound of many harpists, there was a beautiful cacophony of, of praise towards God. In judgment, though, joy ceases and the harps are laid aside. In Isaiah 24, verses 1 and 8, it says, Behold, the Lord lays the earth waste, devastates it, distorts its surface, and scatters its inhabitants. The gaiety of tambourines cease. The noise of revelers stop. The gaiety of the harp ceases. So there's this whole time during the tribulation where the joy of harpists, the, the, the gaiety of song and love and laughter has been deafened by the sound of judgment during the tribulation. And now in the millennial reign of Christ, this one little snippet we get here in these first five verses. Now, before we go back and look at the bold judgments in future chapters, before we get to the description of the millennium later in the book. But here we're given just a little bit of a summary. Now there's a celebration after that has been laid aside. When tribulation passes, judgment is no more. There's reward and peace that is present upon the earth. And in the end, which I read to the end, <laughs> we win. Praise the Lord for that. Let the party begin. Again, this has just been in a very abbreviated form of the message that we had today. Let me silence my phone. Now, I'll get back to that and we'll have to continue talking as we go through there. It says here, uh, as we have abbreviated our passage, what we need to do is go back and take a breath. We've been through a lot here. This is a, a small snippet at the end of the tribulation on into the millennium that we're looking at. And here we want, I just want to bring us to our take it home section that's right there. I'm going to let my assistant take care of the phone for me. Okay, so under the take it home section, there's something I want you to remember. And that's something I would like you to read. If you could take a look at this, um, listen to what I have to say. Under remember, life now is simply a rehearsal for heaven later. Remember that the things we go through, the things we do here on this earth, life now is simply a rehearsal for heaven later. Let that be a part of our life. Live pure Give thanks to God for everything, every day. Rest in his care and provision. Does that mean everything is going to go smoothly now? No, it doesn't. But we're practicing for heaven where everything will go smoothly then. Live pure. Thank God for his, uh, your uniqueness and rest in his care and provision. And then in preparation for um, just understanding where we've been through all this right here, I'd like us to point us sort of as a conclusion and have every, each one of us read Psalm 1 for once, once a day for this entire week. Just sort of to kind of wrap things up in the book of Revelation in chapter 14, the first five verses. So let me read to you, if I could, Psalm 1. This relates to everything that is a practice on earth for the reality of heaven later on. Ball, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so but are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor the sinner in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Would you pray with me? Thank you, Father, for the promise of the millennium. Thank you for your promise that you will save some who will turn their heart to you, even during the tribulation. But thank you that these tribulation saints of the 144,000, they're a great example for us. And help us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm sorry uh, we couldn't recreate the worship team singing for you today. Tune in again next week, and we'll try to have the worship team and the message recorded then. But thank you for stopping by today, and God bless you.